We love unexpected turns and stories, don't we? I do. Um, there's the classic twist in the movie. Think of, you know, for those of you who remember watching Planet of the Apes when it first came out for the very first time, you saw the Statue of Liberty at the very end scene and you realized all of that was happening on planet Earth. Or maybe, maybe you think of Vader telling Luke his actual true parentage. No spoiler alert, but it's been out for a while, as I was told this morning. So uh, kind of just a, a weird twist. Maybe finding out that John Nash isn't who you thought he was in one movie or pretty much any M. Night Shyamalan movie. Uh, they make us sit down, watch it, and like as it's nearing the end, it's, it's wait, what? Oh, that? And then there's always that guy, it's usually me, who's like, I knew it, I knew it, I knew that was going to happen. And we don't know that it was about to happen, but we say we do nonetheless. Well, that's how Jesus told many of his stories, with a surprise ending, with a twist at the end. Nearly every one of them challenged the cultural norms of his day, and many had those surprise endings. We're just desensitized to them. Uh, we're desensitized from their shock value because most of us have grown up in church. We've heard them so many times, so often from a young age that we don't even think about the turn or the twist because we just know that's how it goes. But Jesus told about a good Samaritan. And that seemed like nothing short of an oxymoron to the Jewish listeners who are hearing that story for the very first time. In their minds, nothing good had ever come from Samaria. But then when a priest and a Levite refused to help this man who'd been stolen from and left for dead in a ditch along the roadside, the Jews, Jesus' listeners, they, they had to come to grips with what's our definition of good? If a priest and a Levite will walk by this guy and a Samaritan will help him, that kind of puts the story on its end. Jesus told about a father who welcomed his rebellious son home and the prodigal son. And, and we don't think of that story as a twist, but that was very out of the ordinary. Mosaic law commentated that a child bent on disobedience and lawlessness as the, as the prodigal was. They should actually face civil charges and if we're going strictly by Levitical law, ought to have been stoned to death. So when the dad actually ran, which was a big cultural no-no for a, a rich, wealthy man to run, when that father actually runs and embraces his returning prodigal son who had been feeding unclean hogs, I imagine that there was this gasp and a groan that went up from the Jewish congregation as Jesus was telling the story. And so the, the audience had to grapple with their understanding of love and forgiveness. In Jesus' stories, there's a poor man that dies and goes to heaven, and there's a rich man who dies and goes to hell. A beggar is promoted to the front of the dining table, while a nobleman is demoted to a stool in the corner. There's a powerless widow who gains the attention of an unjust judge. There's a master who serves his servants just for remaining faithful to him. There's a father who throws a wedding feast and skips over the rich and powerful and he invites the poor and the beggars. Those are just a few. Every story upside down from the cultural norm or maybe right side up. Putting to right the wrong view that we have in this world. Well, Jesus tells this story in a similar vein. As we have already read it, you might come away with, it's just wrong, but it's right. It's really right. It's both condemning and freeing to Jesus' listeners who are shocked with almost every sentence. And because we don't live in their culture, we might not feel that same affront to our society as they felt, but we can still get a hint of it. What Jesus told in this story, it was an upside-down or right-side-up kind of world where those beggars can be given right standing. Luke gives this preface in chapter 18, seemingly out of nowhere. Oftentimes, I like to try to give you the context of the passage of Scripture, and this one, quite honestly, it, 
It just comes out of nowhere. In verse 9, it says, Also Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. So right up front, Luke is preparing you for what is about to go on, that another one of Jesus' surprise-ending parables is about to be spoken. He even makes the, this plain condemnation that there were some in the crowd, some in the congregation, who trusted in their own righteousness, and they hated others for not being like them. Can I just stop and say that if there were people 2,000 years ago in the congregation of Israel who loved the law of God, if there were people 2,000 years ago who trusted in their own righteousness and hated others for not being like them, I guarantee you there are some in our pews this morning. Some of you are trusting in your own righteousness. Whether you grew up in church or not. Whether you keep a checklist kind of style of Christianity of I did that, I did that, I didn't do that. I did that, I did that, so I'm good, I'm holy. Or maybe you're just kind of waiting it out as somebody who I spoke to this week saying, I just hope that when I die, my good outweighs my bad. You are trusting in your own righteousness. And Jesus' story is to you this morning. This warning in verse 9, it comes on the heels of some of Jesus' most haunting words about the soon and swift coming of the kingdom. It's found in Luke 17. We don't have time to read all of it. But listen to what Jesus says of this coming kingdom. He says, two will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be out in the field, one will be taken, the other left. He's saying there is coming a time when your life will be required of you. Two in the bed, one taken, the other stay. Two in the field, one taken, the other stays. There's an immediacy to the coming of the kingdom. And he says in verse 33, as kind of the tagline after this whole diatribe about the kingdom of God, he says, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So the people are primed and ready for another story to kind of cut the tension because it's been pretty heavy as Jesus had been teaching, talking about this coming kingdom and about the only way to save your life is to lose your life. But Jesus can see into their hearts, and he knows that many of them, they're still just playing games. They're trusting in themselves instead of realizing how sick, how twisted, how sinful they really are. And so verse 10 of chapter 18, he opens up with, two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. So right from the start, almost like the setup of a bad joke, you know that there's going to be more tension. Two guys walk into a church, and while their differences may abound, Pharisee, tax collector, in the Jewish mindset, there was a, (gasps) they went to church together. Their differences are are ginormous. And no one in Jesus' context would be thinking about their similarities because they are, these men are polar opposites. But I want to, for just a moment, for us to stop and see if we can find some common ground between these two men who seem to be diametrically opposed to each other. 
they both walk into the same house of worship. They don't represent separate faiths or even denominations if we can superimpose some of our own 21st century culture onto Jesus' ancient story. These men go to the same house of worship. They have both come to the temple. And Jesus even tells us for what purpose with the, expre- with the expressed reason to pray. And based upon my study this week, I found that the only daily service that would be held in the temple was what was called the atonement sacrifice. There was one at sunrise and another in the afternoon around three o'clock or so. There was no compulsory responsibility for the Jews to attend, but it was encouraged. They knew that you had jobs to fulfill, and so if you wanted to come, you could. They were going to have the ceremony, the service, nonetheless. So morning and afternoon, a lamb would be slaughtered on an altar. It was a picture of a sacrifice for all of Israel's sin that day. Offered in the morning in case some had sinned throughout the night and offered near the end of the day in case somebody had swindled somebody throughout the day and they needed atoning for in their congregation. So the sacrifice for all of Israel's sin. Specific prayers would be offered up throughout the sacrificial ceremony. There would be a psalm that would be read, much like Rachel read ours this morning. And the whole thing would climax to silver trumpets being blown and tambourines struck so that even those who are outside the temple could hear and they could take part in the appreciation of this most recent sacrifice for their sin. You get kind of a hint of the idea of while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There are people outside the temple who are caught in the very act of sinning and they hear the trumpets. A lamb has just been slain for my sin. Following all that pomp and circumstance, when the tambourines and the the trumpets would die down, the officiating priest would appear in the temple courtyard where he would light the lamps and he would burn incense, which were both a picture of God's people praying, the smoke rising up so that God could see his people praying. And the priest would then invite all in attendance into a personal time of prayer. From this point on, it would be personal now. You, right where you're sitting or standing, you stop. This lamb has just been slain as atonement for your sacrifice. Now you think about this. And you pray about that. That's what was going on. This personal reflection upon this weighty act of killing an animal for their sin. So these two, they're at that same service. They're at the same church, as it were. They're involved in the exact same ritual sacrifice. And they have the exact same posture. They're both standing in the temple. And they're both doing the exact same thing. They're both praying. And they are praying to the exact same entity. Just look at the very beginning of each of their prayers in verses 11 and 13. They're addressing God. And by that, it's hardly a jump to say that they are addressing the same God, the one and true God. But that is where their similarities end. Because these two could not have been more different were they from different planets. And the hearers of Jesus' story that afternoon knew And they knew that it was merely by this introduction that they were different. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. You see, one of these men is a regular to these services, probably attending both services every day his whole life. The other, well, it had been a while. It had been a minute since he attended any kind of event at the temple. 
And that's going to be painfully obvious as the parable goes on that the latter, this tax collector, he didn't know what was the appropriate response. He had no idea what were the social cues in the temple. He didn't even know that people were staring at him because he was doing some pretty wrong things in the temple that morning. He didn't know what he didn't know. Have you ever sat in a church service like that? I sat in one very high church service one time and the, the person at the front was, was saying something and then everybody else was supposed to respond that I had nothing to go off of. I just mouthed my, yeah, yeah, no, yeah I'm good. Look like I'm normal. I'm far from normal. That's this tax collector. Whatever anyone might say about Pharisees, how pompous they acted, how judgmental they were, no one would ever say of these men that they weren't devoted. They were. These were the spiritual elite of their day. These were the gurus, the leaders, the guys who had book deals in the churches, if we want to say it that way. They were the epitome of the Jewish religion. They wouldn't just obey every minute detail of Mosaic law. No, they had to outdo that, and they had to add 613 other laws just to make sure that it didn't even come close to breaking one of the real laws. These guys were serious. The Pharisees prayed in public often. They fasted frequently. And they wanted everyone to know their own piety. I shared with our Wednesday morning Bible study last week that one of the practices that I just read about that the Pharisees would do while they were fasting is that they would grind up ashes and they would brush them on their face in such a way as to contour their cheeks to make them look sunken and their skin sallow so that everybody could see, oh, he he must be fasting. They loved that stuff. I am holy and sad at the same time. They loved it. They wanted the attention. The temple was the Pharisees' home turf. People moved out of the way when he got there. He made his way right up to the front, where I'm sure several of his Pharisee buddies were. He saw the lamb slaughtered. He heard the trumpets blast. He heard the the tambourines clang, and then the priest walking out with lit incense signaled that it was time for the show. Now is my moment. Here it comes. These few minutes of personal devotion and personal prayer. So he moves away from the crowd, and probably he took a step closer to the front so that everybody, even in the cheap seats in the back, they could see him praying And he took center stage. In fact, the Greek word that Luke uses here in just a second that says that he stood, it could really be understood as he was placed there or he struck an attitude in the most literal sense. So this is more akin to theater. It's a take your place kind of thing. It's a strike a pose. This isn't worship. This is theater. In verse 11, it says the Pharisee stood struck that pose, and prayed thus with himself, God, he probably said it deeper than that, like God, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes to all that I possess. Vincent records an old rabbinic teaching that encourages Jews to pray, and when they pray, to thank God every day that he did not create them a Gentile, a plebeian, or a Roman commoner, or a woman. So while you may think that this Pharisee isn't quite so bad and doesn't pray all that, maybe you should read his prayer again. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. He eschews even the the racist, sexist prayer, thanking thanking God that he did not create him like that. And he goes even further to leave God totally out of it. 
We read this as, God, thanks for making who I am, but really what he's praying is, God, thank you that I have made myself who I am. As if he had any say-so on his nationality or his gender. And he didn't. But this fits the wording in Jesus' parable perfectly because in the introduction to this Pharisee's prayer in verse 11, notice what Jesus said of him. He said that he prayed thus with himself. And Bible translators, they're split as to what this actually means. Does it mean, did he pray by himself? Did he separate himself from the crowd? Or does it mean that he prayed to himself? We know that he spoke out loud. Not that he prayed quietly, but that he prayed actually to himself. He didn't care about his prayer getting out of the ceiling. He, he knew it was directed at himself anyway. Whatever the, the original intent was, I think it's plain that while this Pharisee may be addressing God at the outset, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men, he totally leaves God out of this prayer from then on. And it's only serving himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I possess. I honestly think that every single word was directed like an arrow at this tax collector who Scripture says stood afar off, stood behind. He says, Lord, I thank you that I am not an extortioner. Well, the tax collector was an extortioner. The means by which he made his livelihood was more akin to a mob boss increasing taxes to Rome by a percentage of points so that he could skim off the top without Rome knowing or caring about it. So he hustled shop owners and farmers and he shook them down to get every ounce of his payment out of them. He was an extortioner, this taxpayer was. And the Pharisee also says, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other men, the unjust, and this tax collector was unjust. When he became a tax collector for Rome, he pretty much sold out and betrayed his own countrymen, kind of like a a French business owner informing to the Nazis during World War II on his own countrymen. This tax collector denied Israel's right to the land and thereby betrayed even his own people and his own God. Lord, thank you that I am not an adulterer as others are. Well, it's very likely that this tax collector was an adulterer. While it's never explicitly told in the text, this tax collector has committed adultery, it, would be, it wouldn't be much of a stretch. In fact, whenever Jesus was ridiculed for who he hung out with, you'll notice that they usually say he hangs out with tax collectors and prostitutes. They're always lumped together. And that might be because of their shared sin together, that they lived with each other, that they took part in the same sin, or it may be because how similar their jobs were, each selling themselves out for some gain. That was the tax collector. And finally, the Pharisee just comes out and he says, I am not, thank you, God, thank you that I am not like this tax collector And as if to kind of pinpoint how he's not like him, he says, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. Essentially, he's calling this publican a drunk and a glutton, while on the other hand, he's pointing out his own piety. He fasted twice a week. Normally, in the Pharisaical tradition, it would have been Monday and Thursdays. And that was way more than what was commanded once a year of them as Jews, just fasting to ready themselves for the atonement, for the day of atonement. They did this twice a week. Instead of taking money through extortion like the tax collector did, this Pharisee wants God and everyone else to listen that he tithes off every single thing he owns. Again, all of this is just a punch in the tax collector's direction What are you doing here? Get out. You're not welcome. We are not like you. I don't know if you feel convicted yet, Christian, but 
We should. We should. How many times have we played this role? Obviously, obviously. None of us have ever said it out loud. No, let's be honest with ourselves. Some of us have said it out loud. We have. We've said some of the exact same things. And if maybe you haven't verbalized it ever, our bug eyes, our raised eyebrows, our refusal to go and welcome that person sitting right down our pew is just as bad. God, thank you for not making me like one of these. It just so happened to slither in to New Hope Free Old Baptist Church today. It's just so, just as worse. What's crazy is that the Pharisee had forgotten the very reason why the temple had that service that he was attending. It was clockwork for him, sunrise and three o'clock, sunrise and three o'clock. That's, I go to the temple, that's what I do. He had forgotten that an innocent lamb's throat had just been slit. Blood had just gushed out onto the altar, collected in bowls and sprinkled everywhere by the priest as a symbol of the blood of an innocent thing having to be spilt for the payment of sin. And all this dude can think about is how much better he is than the tax collector. He's wanting to nitpick the man's life apart. He was totally desensitized to the value of life and the cost or the penalty for sin. He'd forgotten the, the reason why he was there. I have a confession this, it, it is embarrassing to me. In fact, it happened yesterday and I really didn't want to add it to the sermon, but just to kind of show you how we act sometimes. Yesterday, I was scrolling through social media and I saw a photo of some of our local rescue workers getting into floodwaters to save people. Do you know what the first thing was that jumped out at me? It wasn't Lord, thank you for these people who are willing to jump into the flood and, and pull people to safety. No. The first thing that jumped out to me was they misspelled the word drowned. That was my takeaway from the post. I snickered without even thinking what I was doing, and then it hit me. I mean, I'm preparing a sermon, final touches on a sermon about people who forget about the main point of why they're there, and here I am. Oh, these guys. Don't they know how to spell drowned? These guys are trying to find some of the 30-plus souls missing in one of our nearby counties, and there I was, dry, smirking in my office over a misspelled word. How petty. The whole point is they're trying to get somebody to safety. And I'm stuck on a misspelled word. Well, here this tax collector, he's come to afternoon sacrifice because he needs saving. And someone who knows everything about the Bible, about the Bible, he wants to rub his face in all of his misspellings when the point is that the whole ceremony, the whole idea of praying and atonement and sacrifice was to show him how to be saved. How petty. Lord, thank you that I'm not like that guy. We do it in church. We complain and we bicker over small things of absolutely no eternal value at all. All the while, tax collectors in our midst who have come to hear the answers to life 
and we can't hear it or we can't see it. That's why I love this tax collector, because I wish I were him. Verse 13, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He feels out of place. Man, does he feel it. He looks out of place, if we're to be all honest. He's nowhere where he should be. He's afar off. We don't know if that means away from the temple courtyard, away from the Pharisee, or metaphorically just far away from God. I doubt the latter, even though that's how he feels. He can't even look up. He hasn't taken the, po- he hasn't taken the posture of Isaiah yet and falling down like he was dead, but he's pretty close to it. The man cannot even lift his chin up. He knows he's wrong. He knows he's been caught. He knows it. And he can't even look up. Can you see him in your mind's eye? I mean, can you just use your imagination with me a little bit this morning? Can you see him there at the the outskirts of the temple courtyard? Everybody else is there. I mean, he's he's tried to slip away almost. And, And the Pharisee still keeps kind of bringing him back in his prayer. Lord, I'm not like that guy. He's so ashamed. He's so far from what he used to be. You see, more than likely at some point growing up, he had known the right way to live. He prayed often. He worshiped at the temple. He read the Torah and probably had a lot of it memorized. But for one reason or another, the lure of this world had taken him away and he had sold himself. He had prostituted himself to Rome so that he could get more money out of his own people. He had pretty much sold his birthright of being a Jew so that he could get more cash in his pocket. And so now he stands afar off, not looking up, beating his chest. And I'm sure that if the Pharisee got distracted for just a second, he kind of looked back at him and, and smirked at that last part. What's he doing? What's he doing? Beating his chest like that, making a spectacle of himself. He doesn't even know how to mourn properly. See, I didn't know it until I began reading a little bit more, but in Middle Eastern culture, this chest beating, it was almost solely practiced by the women of the community. It was the common practice for a woman to show her grief was to beat her chest. Men, they would put on sackcloth and ashes, but usually women, they were the only ones to mourn this way. There's only one occasion in, throughout the entire Bible where this kind of mourning is seen by men, and it's at the foot of the cross as people walked away, Jesus hanging there, Scripture says, and they beat their chest. This is more grief than you can ever imagine. He doesn't care about social norms. He doesn't care about who's looking. He just knows that there's an emptiness in his heart and he feels it. Brokenness. And I think that picture at the foot of the cross of people walking away, beating their chest, I think that probably gets us pretty close to the point. We don't know why this tax collector chose to go to the temple that day, but I think it's safe to say because he's feeling the emptiness of this life, the weight of his sin, and so he goes. He shuns the shame and the whispers and the pointed fingers and even the louder than usual praying that he knows it's directed right at him. He watches as this innocent lamb bleeding until it bleeds He gets the symbolism. His parents had taught him that much. He should have been the one on the altar. He 
should be the one held responsible for his sin. And yet, it's taken out on this little lamb. And so he beats his chest in utter despair. He bows his head in total shame. He feels the emptiness of his life when he prays, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You see, there's a definite article there that most English Bible translators edit out because it just sounds clunky in English, but what he has just said is, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, slanderers, adulterers, even like this. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. If no one else in that congregation of Israel felt the weight of their sin, this man did. He would have said like Paul, I am the chief of sinners. His prayer is completely different from the Pharisees. Not only is it addressed to God, but only God can fulfill it. While the Pharisee had just essentially prayed, God, thank you that I have made myself who I am. His prayer is only, be merciful to me, the sinner. I can't do this of my own accord. Understood within the context of the whole event, the tax collector is begging God to make atonement for him. He is essentially saying, Lord, don't just atone for all the sin of Israel. Atone for my sin, my personal sin. Atone, cover mine as well with the blood of that lamb. He he saw himself as outside of the atonement. Not part of Israel. He had betrayed his countrymen. He had sinned against God. And he had lived completely and totally unlike someone who was supposed to be a person who had a, a covenant with God. And so he's saying, God, give atonement to me, the sinner. Can I just tell you within the grand scheme of Scripture, I don't think it's an accident that in less than a week's time, Jesus is going to walk through Jericho. He's going to see a tiny tax collector up in a tree, and he's going to invite himself to his home for lunch. And you remember what what Jesus said to Zacchaeus following that tax collector's public pronouncement of faith? He said, Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus, where once you had been spurred by Israel, now you've been grafted back into the fold. You are now a son of Abraham again. And he's saying to this tax collector in the parable the exact same thing. You're now part of the family. Make atonement for you? Absolutely, I will. Not with just the blood of the Lamb, but with my own Son's blood on Calvary. Matter of fact, the whole story of Zacchaeus closes with this beautiful shot, with kind of the, the, the lyric scrolling across the scene of, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, that day in that parable, salvation came to that tax collector's heart too. He's beating his breast. He's bowing his head. He's standing afar off. And Jesus said of him in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Let's just stop. Just stop for a minute. Two people walked into church today. The Pharisee and the tax collector. Now thankfully, Jesus loves Pharisees. Amen? In John 3, he spent an entire evening looking and pleading with Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Nicodemus, 
You must be born again. You've come this morning. You've got it all figured out. Are you sure? Thank you, do. You know what you're trusting in. I'm not that bad of a person. I'm really not. I'm pretty good. In the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm actually top shelf. But you're trusting in your own righteousness, and you are despising others who are not like you. Jesus is warning the Pharisees. Hypocrisy is just as bad as adultery. Self-righteousness, it's just as bad as extortion. Your sin just looks different, but it's still sin. And a lamb still had to die. And the lamb will one day have to be slain. It's still sin. Pharisee? Two people came into church this morning. The Pharisee who doesn't know he's a sinner and the tax collector who knows it and he's reminded of it often. I am a sinner. One's got flowery words in his prayer. The other is straight to the point. One's got perfect posture, looks clean, looks right, looks like a church member at New Hope Free Old Baptist Church. The other, man, he doesn't look, act, or smell like a member of a church. And what does Jesus say? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Praise God for that. And then that next phrase, rather than the other. Aren't you thankful that it's not a competition, that you can come to Christ as a Pharisee, as a tax collector, and as long as you see your sin and know that you need a Savior, you can, whichever side of the aisle you might find yourself on, you can go home justified this morning. It does not matter your pedigree, the style of sin that you have chosen to live in your life. It does not matter. You can be justified. You know what that word means? It would take us an hour to really unwrap it. But it means one who has obtained a right standing. One who has been given a great reward in spite of a horrible crime. Justified. Someone whose sin has been covered, atoned, to where you are no longer seen, but Christ on Calvary is seen. And we're left with this final directive from Christ. He says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You're going to spend your whole life And you're going to be so scared of what other people might say if you come down to an altar or if you get into a baptistry and you're going to say, well, people are going to think that I'm really bad. No, they know you're really bad because they know that they themselves are really bad. They have been here before. You're going to live your entire life and you're going to be so scared about what other people will think that you will go home to your house damned and looking really good. Don't do it. Do not do it. Two guys walk into church. They couldn't be any more different. 
But the main difference, if you cut through all of the other fake stuff, the main difference between these two is that one goes home justified and the other goes home unforgiven. Nothing else matters. Which are you? Which are you?